So good afternoon, everyone. I'm very glad to tell you today about the work on post-quantum key agreement from both ideal and generic lattices. So my name is Valeria Nikolaenko. I'm a PhD student at Stanford University. For the most part, I will be focusing on two papers, which is a new hope that builds key agreement from ideal lattices and Frodo that builds on generic lattices. So people that worked on New Hope are Erdo Malkin, Leo Duca, Thomas Pappelmann, and Peter Schwab. And further authors are Yopi Boss, Craig Costello, Leo Duca, Ilya Mironov, Mihail Neirik, myself, Anand Rankunathan, and Douglas Stebula. So we will focus here on protecting currently deployed and widely used cryptography against quantum computers. So let's look at the main crypto primitives that are used in TLS. This is public key cryptography, including key agreements and signatures, and the examples of that would be RSA, DV Hellman, and elliptic curve-based analogs. Then there is um, symmetric encryption, like IES-128, and hash functions, like SHA-256, SHA-3. Unfortunately, quantum computers can break currently used public key crypto, meaning there are efficient quantum algorithms that can break RSA, DV Hellman, and the family. So they will need to be replaced, and in fact, NIST is calling for proposals. Symmetric key cryptography will need larger keys, and hash functions will need longer outputs, and that's because of better quantum brute force attacks. But we know that quantum computers cannot provide an exponential speed up for such algorithms, thus there is no reason to believe that other symmetric key crypto hash functions will need to be replaced, so we're good with the existing primitives, and that's why all effort needs to be concentrated on developing and deploying new public key cryptography. So let's see how these primitives are used in TLS. Let me very quickly go over the protocol. It will be a very high-level overview. So the first part is the handshake, where two parties establish a shared symmetric key through a couple rounds of communication, such that any eavesdropper who is listening on this communication will have no idea about the established shared key. So it goes as follows. The client initiates the connection with a dummy hello message. The server replies with a certificate chain and server's key exchange message. Then the client sends his portion of the key exchange and they finish the handshake. And at this point, from two key exchange messages, both the client and the server compute the symmetric shared key K. And onward, they will encrypt the rest of the communication using the symmetric shared key and some fast symmetric cipher like IAS, for example. Roughly, the protocol can be subdivided into three parts. The first part is where the server authenticates itself to the client. The second part is where the client and the server agree on the key. And the third part is where the traffic is encrypted using symmetric encryption. So we don't worry about protecting the first part against quantum attacks. And that's because suddenly in the future, when quantum computers are around, they will be able to impersonate the server, but this will not compromise the authenticity of today's connections. To protect the last part, the symmetric encryption, we just need to double the size of the key, so that's easy. But the protocol we use for key agreement can now be broken by a quantum computer, meaning there are efficient quantum algorithms that can recover the symmetric shared key and decrypt the rest of the traffic. It's, here is an important point to understand. If someone records these connections today and gets a quantum computer in the future, then they'll be able to go back and break into the connections that we do today. And that's why we need to start moving towards quantum-resistant crypto protocols now to protect our today's communications, perhaps most valuable of them, from being decrypted by a quantum computer in the future. So this is the motivation, and in this talk I will discuss works that propose new algorithms for key agreements. But first you may wonder, should we really expect a quantum computer? Will it ever be built? So you'll uh, hear more about that on Friday morning, I guess. Uh, it's still a highly debatable question, but suddenly there was a tremendous progress over the last decade. There are many ways to argue that you should indeed care. Uh, let me show you a few of them. So perhaps the most successful groups comes from University of Santa Barbara. They are supported by Google, and they predict a quantum computer capable of breaking today's keys in 15 years from today for a budget of about $1 billion. The next fact is in 2014, from revelations of Edward Snowden, we learned that NSA, for example, is working on building a quantum computer. And a year ago, they put a notice on their website urging us to move towards quantum secure cryptography and encouraging research in this direction. So these two facts coming from NSA might be somewhat worrisome. Overall, there is an ever-growing effort and a lot of investment in this area, so probably we need to prepare quantum secure alternatives 
for our crypto, keeping in mind that standardization will likely take a long time. So now I'm ready to explain you the new proposals for new quantum secure key exchanges. The most studied cryptographic assumption that is considered so far to be um, secure against quantum attacks is a lattice-based assumption called learning with errors. This assumption is very easy to explain. Essentially, it states that it's hard to find solutions to the system of linear equations if we add some small noise to these equations. So let me explain it in pictures. If I give you a square matrix A and a vector A times X, then it's easy to find X. From algebra 101, we know that you can find X, for example, by Gaussian elimination. But now, instead of giving you the vector A times X, I, beforehand, I add some small vector e to it. So the elements of this vector e would be very small. Then suddenly it's become, it, it becomes really hard to find x. And it's not only hard to find x, it's also hard to tell whether the vector that I gave you was constructed this way or whether I picked it completely and uniformly at random. Okay? And this is the assumption. That's it. So for random matrix A, small vectors x and e, given the matrix A, a times x plus e is indistinguishable from random. So this assumption was introduced by Regev in 2005. And you may notice here that all operations are done modulo q. And this will be important later on. It's easy to show that the previous assumption can be generalized uh, to the case when x is a matrix. So we can blow up the dimension of x a little bit. Further key ex exchange is based on this problem. It means that if you want to break into the Frodo key exchange, you'll have to break this assumption. You might have heard about, about a related assumption called ring LWE. It's essentially the same as general LWE, except the matrices there, instead of being uniformly random matrices, will have additional structure. Namely, each row of the matrix will be cyclic shift of the row above. And you, when you circle the value around, you'll put a negative sign in front of it. So enter crypto system. Uh, if you heard of it, also builds on lattices with additional structure of similar kind. So this modified assumption was specifically introduced to give more efficient protocols in terms of communication and computation. So you can see, for example, that we don't need to transfer the whole matrix to the other party. We can just uh, transfer the first row, and then the other party can reconstruct this matrix from the first row by applying this wrapping rule. Um, in fact, the Computations can be done more efficiently as well. Essentially, you can use number theoretic transform to do matrix matrix product. So you can think of real LWE as exact same assumption as general LWE, except we only consider cyclic matrices with this funny wrapping rule. So if you remove the word cyclic from the slide, you'll get the, assum the previous assumption, the general LWE. And the new hope key agreement is based on this problem, which means if you want to break new hope key agreement, you have to break into this problem. You have to build a distinguisher. So I will now describe you the key agreement based on these assumptions. Before, let me briefly remind you how the Diffie-Hellman handshake works, because LWE-based handshakes will be very similar, and I want to put them side by side. So in Diffie-Hellman, the server picks random x and sends g to the x over to the client. The client chooses random y and sends g to the y back to the server. And now both the server and the client can compute g to the xy. So for example, the server can take, client, can take client's message, raise it to the secret power x, and get g to the xy. And from this symmetric shared value, they can derive a symmetric key. So the difficult assumption in this case will have the following form. If you're given g, g to the x, and g to the y, and that's exactly what the eavesdropper sees uh, when he observes the communication, you can't distinguish g to the x, y from random. In other words, the adversary cannot guess the shared key any better than by a random guess. So LWE-based key agreement is very similar, except instead of raising g to powers, we'll be multiplying matrix A by other matrices. So the server will pick random small matrices x and e and send a times x plus e to the client. And remember that LWE assumption guarantees that this message will look uniformly random, independent of x. The client on his side will pick random matrices, small matrices y and e prime, and send y times a plus e prime over to the server. And notice that the client and the server are doing multiplications on different sides of the matrix. Then the server can take client's message multiplied by x on the right and get um, something that's close to y times 
a times x. Because when you multiply the noise vector e by x, you multiply in two small matrices, you'll get something small. So this is an approximate key agreement. Um, at this point, both parties can discard least significant bits, which will be different between them. They can take the most significant bits, and this will be the shared key. But since we're working in modulo Q, we will need to do something a bit more sophisticated than just taking the most significant bits. Namely, the client will have to send a few more bits over to the server to make sure that they both do the rounding correctly. And you can look uh, in the papers for rigorous explanation. The important thing to keep in mind here is that the protocol has a non-zero probability of failure when the parties arrive with different keys, in which case they need to abort and start all over again. But when tuning the parameters, we make sure that this probability is very low. In fact, it can even be made zero, but we can significantly shrink the communication if we allow for it to just be small, which we recommend. So the, uh, the assumption in this case will have the following form. Given the matrix A and two messages of the handshake, the adversary can only get the shared key by a random guess. So in the security proofs from the paper, papers, we show that if one can break this, then um, it can be used to break LWE assumption. So if you're using uniformly random matrices here, you'll be able to break a learning, L, uh, learning with errors. If you're using cyclic matrices, you'll be able to uh, break ring learning with errors, if you can break this. So this is the handshake that you've just seen. I just want to emphasize a few important points here. So in practice, instead of fixing a matrix A in a new standard or elsewhere, and having the same matrix for all or multiple key exchanges, we propose generating a fresh matrix for every key exchange. This will defend us against pre-computation attacks on this matrix and will ensure that the matrix is not backdoored. Uh, since matrix A is rather big, instead of sending it over the network, we propose generating it from the seed. So the server will sample uniformly random seed, apply pseudo-random generator to generate his matrix A. He will send the seed over to the client, and the client will do the same thing. For security tasks, we will rely on our learning assumption plus, plus the security of pseudo-random generator. The X and Y secrets and the noise will be coming from distribution that will be a parameter in our system, and will be an approximation to a discrete Gaussian. A bit of history. So the first lattice-based crypto system was Entru, introduced in 1996 with no reductions from hard programs over lattices. In 1997, ITIDE work gave a first public encryption system based on hardness of finding short, ve short vectors and lattices. In 2005, Regev introduced the LDWI assumption uh, that I've just shown you. And five years later, Lubashevsky, Pikert, and Regev introduced the Ring LW version. Dina Toll gave key, a key agreement protocol from both problems. Pikert improved the Ring version of the protocol. Later, Boss et al. implemented this protocol, selected concrete parameters, integrated the protocol into the OpenSSL, and measured the performance. Alkim et al. recently improved the parameters, distributions, and got better performance. And for the paper, it gave a first LWE-based key agreement, breaking the widely accepted presumption that only ring LWE systems can be practical. And further improvements were made. Google recently uh, introduced their new Hope Cypher suits as an option Chrome Canary. And this was a proof of concept. Google confirmed that we can quickly move to lattice-based Cypher suits might the need arise. A few more words about the assumptions before um, Right, so LWE assumption was studied for more than a decade and is considered to be one of the best candidates for being both efficient and quantumly secure. LWE assumption has a very nice property. It has what's called worst case to average case reductions. What it means is that if there is an adversary that can break the assumption for a random matrix A, or in other words, can break a key agreement on average, then this adversary can be used to break the assumption for any matrix meaning you don't need to worry about hard or easy matrices. You can just pick a matrix for your key exchange at random, and you would be good. And this is not the case for factoring or discrete logarithms, where you need to be really careful when picking your primes, your finite groups, or your elliptic curves, and that's why they're fixed in standards. Also, this assumption is something different from the two that we use today, which is hardness of factoring and hardness of solving discrete logarithms. And Potentially, this could be a third leg for crypto to stand on. As a side note, you might have heard that lattice-based assumptions give a very rich set of other crypto primitives, like, for example, fully homomorphic encryption, 
attribute-based encryption, and even obfuscation. So if we make lattice-based key agreements efficient, we can start looking into other fun stuff. So currently we have two candidate schemes for key agreements, the Frodo based on LWE problem. It uses uniformly random matrices with no additional structure, and the New Hope, which is based on ring LWE problem and uses cyclic matrices. Currently, there is no reason to believe that ring LWE is weaker than LWE. We only know exponential time algorithms for both problems. Um, so far, I didn't really talk about lattices, so here they come. It was shown that LWE problem is as hard as gap SVP, and gap SVP asks to approximate the length of the shortest factor in an n-dimensional lattice within some polynomial approximation factor gamma. People were working on this gap SVP problem for about a century, starting with the work of Gauss, Harmite, and Minkowski, so we have strong confidence that LWE problem is hard. Unfortunately, we don't have any strong results of this kind for renal WE. By analogy, we knew that renal WE is as hard as ideal SVP, which asks to find a short vector in an ideal lattice. But recently, this problem became nearly broken. Uh, Kramer, Duca, and Vesalovsky discovered a polynomial time al algorithm for a sub-exponential gamma. Though this result does not affect the security of renal WE assumption, our confidence in its connection to lattice problems was kind of shaken. So perhaps you should be careful when using rings. And uh, Frodo gives an alternative protocol that gets rid of ring structure. Um, what it means, and that's my own opinion, is that perhaps Frodo key agreement is a more secure one or more conservative in terms of security, but you'll see later that the new hope is a lot more efficient. So the most important question when designing real-world crypto systems, of course, is how do we choose parameters? So our key agreement essentially has, is parameterized by three numbers, the modulus, so all operations will be done module Q, the dimension N, so our matrix is N by N, and the distribution. And we'll use approximations to Gaussians because Gaussians uh, are used to show reductions to this uh, lattice problems. So we can search the space of parameters to find the best set that minimizes communication and computation and satisfies the following three requirements. So based on state-of-the-art and crypto analysis, both classical and quantum attacks should run in time more than 2 to the 128, to have at least 128 bits of quantum security. The probability of failure should be small, and we should have enough material at the end to be able to extract a 256 bits shared key to be used in the symmetric encryption of the payload. So here on the slide you can see the parameters that they recommended for Frodo and the New Hope. So let's look at the Frodo parameters first. The module skew is 2 to the 15, which means each number very conveniently fits into two bytes integer, and we don't need to worry about mod operations, essentially get them for free and is in the order of 800, the failure probability is less than once in a billion. So in practice, the connections get dropped at a significantly higher rate due to various reasons. So we per perceive this probability, failure probability as being unnoticeable. The quantum security for the set based on state of the art is 130 bits. And the parameters for Frodo were cho chosen using search scripts because Frodo protocol essentially allows for arbitrary Q and N. The new hope parameters are very similar in size, so Q is 13 bits prime and N is about 1,000. To utilize number theoretic transform-based operations, the parameters for the new hope have to be picked in a very specific way, namely Q should be a prime, N should be a power of 2, and they should satisfy some relation. Uh, so the parameters for new hope were rather handcrafted. The failure probability is also very small, and the security for new hope is 255 bits. And note that the security levels are different, and the new hope is more conservative in this regard, but in fact, we only need to have 128 bits of quantum security. A few more words about the noise distributions. So how exactly do we approximate Gaussians? By a tall reference at the bottom showed how to substitute a Gaussian with another distribution in the lattice-based proofs using Rene divergence as a measure of security loss. So New Hope used their technique to substitute a Gaussian for binomial distribution, which is a lot more simpler and efficient to sample from. The distribution recommended by New Hope requires 32 random bits, uh, 
So you just take these bits and add them up. That's it. And it's naturally constant time. In Frodo, though, through search scripts, we found an optimal discrete distribution that would minimize the Rene divergence, enhance the security loss, and will require fewer random bits. And we represent the distribution in Frodo with a lookup table. Uh, so this is on the slide the recommended distribution for Frodo. It needs only 12 random bits to draw a sample and will need to scan a table of 14 bytes to be constant time. Uh, so both protocols have constant time implementations written in pure C. The implementations are based on the Oculus project that Douglas, one of the authors on Frodo, was working on. The Oculus project aggregates the existing quantum resistant implementation, enables their fast uh, comparison and prototyping within OpenSSL. So check it out. The protocols were benchmarked against RSA, ECDHE, and all available implementations for protocols that are claimed to be quantum resistant. So both uh, suits are integrated into OpenSSL, where new cipher suits are introduced, such as the ones that uh, do pure l handshake and the ones that combine the l handshake with diffie hellman And I'll explain why this is a good idea in just a second. But, uh, so let's look at the standalone performance for the protocols. So the protocols I'm focusing on are highlighted in red. We can compare against RSA and ECDHE, which are the most widely used protocols for handshakes on the internet today. Then follows the lattice-based implementations, which are Entro, New Hope, and Frodo, and two other alternatives, which is uh, SIDH-based, this is a quantum secure alternative to Diffie-Hellman, and Michaelis, which is a code-based key exchange. And you see that SIDH is too slow to be competitive, on the, although maybe Michael will um, update us on that. And Michaelis generates too much traffic. So let's concentrate on what's important. And you may notice somewhat different security levels. Since ECDG is taking lead today, we compare ourselves primarily against it. So keep in mind that the numbers for ECDG shown here are for the unoptimized P256 curve. Lately, the default in OpenSSL was changed to use the optimized Vlad Krasnov's implementation, which is faster, so just keep this in mind. You may see that the Frodo protocol is about two times slower and generates about eight times more traffic than ECDG if we take into account the certificate, which is, for example, three kilobytes for Google.com. The New Hope and Entro are doing better. New Hope is actually faster than unoptimized ECDG and generates just two times more traffic. Both works demonstrate quite surprisingly that key agreements from lattices um, are very competitive and you see that they take just milliseconds and the traffic is just in the order of tens of kilobytes. So everything is very small and fast. It's important to recognize that for the next few years of deployment of new cipher suits, they're likely to be used in hybrid modes. So we should suggest using both post-quantum key agreement protocols in conjunction with traditional ones, for example, pair up ECDH and New Hope or ECDH with Frodo, then in order to break the protocol, the adversary will need to break both assumptions separately. The New Hope hybrid was recently introduced in the test version of Chrome, and for a few months you could uh, do uh, key agreements using lattice-based suits. Of course, for hybrid cipher suits, the difference between lattice-based protocols becomes less pronounced. So Perhaps standalone, standalone numbers do not reflect the actual cost of switching the cipher suits as well. What number really matters is how many more servers will you need to buy to serve your traffic, and to understand that, we need to look at the throughput, number of connections per second. So we ran a server that under heavy load measured throughput with different protocols, varying the size of the payload da data from one byte to 100 kilobytes. And you can see the result on this graph. So we compare three lattice cipher suits, New Hope, Enter, and Frodo in hybrid modes and ECDG. And you can see when serving very small pages, the difference between Frodo and New Hope is 1.5. And not surprisingly, it drops down when we increase the size of the page. It's already 1.2 for 100 kilobyte payloads. To summarize, there exist already key agreements from LWE and RENLWE that are ready to be used or ready to be attacked, whichever you prefer. Everything has constant time implementations, and both algorithms are integrated into OpenSSL. Both papers give very nice alternatives to noise sampling, which are constant time. Communication remains the main bottleneck in all these protocols. 
both papers propose various interesting tricks that allow to shrink the communication. If you come up with something, uh, some more tricks, you will, would be very welcome. All code is open source, including the scripts for finding parameters, scripts for estimating the cost of known attacks, scripts for choosing error distributions. The OpenSSL with integrated ciphers is also available open source. So feel free to check it out. And you can find many more benchmarking numbers obtained using the OQS framework in the Frodo paper. So that's all I have. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Lara. So we have time for some questions. So actually, I'll ask a question. Uh, so Hugo brought up this uh, issue that uh, since we're building security for 30 years from now, we might 128-bit security might not be enough. So do, do you have a sense of like if you had to go to say, you know, 150-bit security, how how would Frodo uh, behave in those settings? Uh, well, so our security estimates are very very conservative. Um, so it's likely that same parameters will withstand attacks in 50 years from today. But that's a valid point. Also, the question is, how fast will the quantum computers be? And that's kind of hard to predict. So, but that's a very good question. Yeah. So, so you say 128-bit security, but really it's probably more than 128 bits. Yeah, it's probably more. Yeah. I have kind of a related question. Um, so this presentation in particular, but the whole session on quantum cryptography seems to have this assumption or be based on the notion that we should already be doing something post-quantum in the real world. So by that, and uh, I'm kind of mean, I should immediately today basically go start in, you know, trying to create my new super secret system using the stuff that's in OpenSSL, for example, already, and all the other implementations that are open source. And yet, I'm seeing that, you know, you mentioned the math and the paper that shook your faith in Ring, LWE. Um, what do we recommend here? I mean, you know, should I actually just increase my key sizes for doing RSA and assume that we won't build a big enough quantum computer in the near future uh, as an immediate real world thing? Or is it actually realistic that I should start going and doing something here with these new protocols? Just your opinion, I know. <laughs> My opinion and I, see Dan, opinion. I see Dan shaking his head in the wings. <laughs> <laughs> well, my opinion is that you should definitely start thinking about it, at least. Um, maybe not immediately use it, but start research in this direction. And then we'll, we'll see what the progress is, uh, the concurrent progress in the, uh, from physicists who are building quantum computer. So I know just uh, things to think about. I have to add to that. So, I mean, the NIST process is just starting. The, I, th I, I would say the advice is do nothing. Just wait for the NIST process to end, and then do whatever, uh, whatever is agreed upon. What? Plan. Plan to do nothing now. Plan to do something, and wait for the NIST process to run its course. Great. I can tell my manager that. Yes. That, that works. Yes. People love this advice. Do nothing. People love this. Yes. Great. Any other, any other questions? All right, thanks, Lara. This is really good.